please don't thank me yet. Um, all right, guys. I'm Betsy. Nice to meet everybody and see y'all. Um, okay. And thanks for asking me to talk again about one thing I'm really obsessed with, which is the power law in real life. So I started learning about social networks in grad school last year, and I learned about the power law distribution and how it arises in like normal day-to-day -day life there. Have any of you guys ever heard of that, like the power law? Okay, like is mm -hmm. it like the 80-20 thing? Is it the yeah. same as law of attraction or? It actually like weirdly is, which I didn't know, but like, okay. you know, like the power of positive thinking, like yeah. that sounds like it's like a BS thing, but there's actually like. No, I really like, it's like science. Like the, right, like, yeah, exactly. So I'll get in, I'll explain like how the power law, like the power law is actually like something a little bit different, but it, they called it the power of attraction because it, it leads to a power law distribution. Mm -hmm. um, so the, when I say the power law, I'm talking about the power law distribution. Um, some people call it the 80-20 rule where it's like 20% of your like sales people do 80% of work. I was like, I can't even think of like an example of like a business thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I'll get into that more. Um, but so yeah, I started learning about this stuff in grad school and then it kind of became an obsession for me. And now I'm like this guy, Charlie, with the red string. I see the power law distribution everywhere. Um, and so I'm gonna try and distill the most relevant parts of my background in probability, computer science, network theory, aka graph theory, and social networks computing um, in just this little short time. So please bear with me if it seems like a little crazy sometimes. Because uh, I'm trying to do it because I think it's worth it because Ever since I learned about this stuff, the entire way that I see everything has changed um, for the better, I think, and it's made me see the whole natural world and human behavior, including life at Vettery, with more clarity, and I think it's made me a more empathetic person, actually. Shocking, because math. You, you learned about it in a class? I learned about it in my whole, like, yeah. I learned it especially, like, in one class, which was uh, computing of social networks and um, now and like it's it comes up everywhere but I just didn't know why I didn't know about this uh, the underlying network of it so next okay uh, so first some background for contrast to a power law distribution I want to talk first about the normal distribution so most things in life are normal a quick reminder about the bell curve when we say things are normally distributed, it means they follow this curve. Uh, the x-axis represents the possible values that one could get for a certain, like as a result of a certain trial, and the y represents the frequency of that value. So the normal distribution is called normal because it is normal. This is the way things occur most of the time in nature, and I'll explain why. It's so ubiquitous in a second, but first I'll give you guys some real life examples. Um, some things that are normal. These are babies' birth weight weights. So like towards the middle, like this is what I meant. It's like the X is like the actual weight. The Y is the number of the frequency of that weight occurring. So the ones towards the middle occur the most. Um, and then I just thought I'd tell you more about myself too. Uh, and magenta is my birth weight. <laughs> and green is my goal weight. <laughs> um, these are SAT scores from 2010. Uh, these are. That was so funny. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. More that to come. Um, so yeah. So these are. An this is another thing that follows the, nor the normal curve is SAT scores. And again, in the interest of full transparency, I even marked off, marked off my precise score with this green line here. <laughs> here is the average height of my exes. I mean NBA players and. Uh, you guys, that was a joke, okay? <laughs> I date short guys too. Um, so, the, so you can see that this still follows a normal curve. Uh, it's like a little bit skewed to the side, but that's still a normal distribution. And in my free time, I also plotted out the heights of the <laughs> NBA players that Kardashians have dated. It also follows a normal distribution. Um, <laughs> average daily returns of random stocks over some time period. I left this one intentionally vague because 
If you want to hear more about daily stock prices, you should just ask Adrian, who sits next to me. You can also hear more about that even if you don't ask Adrian. You just have to sit next to him every day. Um, that joke was less mean when he was like here. He liked it. Um, I assure you, he was into it. Um, okay. This one's really interesting to me. This is the number of oh, unique words used per rapper in their first 35,000 lyrics. So like in the first 35,000 like little like lines of a song, how many new words do they? Like if they say baby once, that's one count. And then when they say baby again, they don't count that again. So it's like basically a measure of like how rich and varied is their vocabularies. And this one's really interesting to me because they also graphed it out by, they colored it by uh, the decade. The magenta is the 80s. Um, the 90s is this green. And the 2000s is the blue. And the 2010s, like up till now, is the red. So the people over here use the most like rich, varied vocabulary. And the people here use the fewest words. So it's like Lil Yachty, Lil Baby, Kodak Black, Wiz Khalifa, YG, Migos. And then over here is like Wu-Tang. Um, so yeah, I just think that's so interesting because like I do feel like, I'm like, ah, oh, is it, am I just older? Like, are so they getting younger? what you're saying is on the decline. I'm saying that the rappers like, yeah, are on the decline. Like, I mean, the, the rappers that are like popular. popular are, but I think that there's still rappers that are less popular. It's just what people like. Eminem. Eminem is like actually he's probably at, a, at a healthy like. Yeah, he's right there. He's, yeah, in the tallest. He's in the middle. He's in the middle. So that actually like you have to remember that's that, that's like average. He's like average for a rapper, which to me is kind of surprising because he seems really like smart. But yeah, he's cute. Um, I think that that's because we could argue why he's so smart, even though his words aren't as varied. It's like how he uses them. But um, so the people here are the ones with the, the people here are the ones with the richest vocabulary. So like, there's a small number of people with these. These are the people that. But isn't that crazy? This just naturally occurs, like in how people like speak. It's basically a representation of that. And then what else? Oh, these are some of my favorite rappers. If you would like to go to a show together, please have it. Um, Okay, so most things aren't normal, but why is it that the normal curve is everywhere? Okay, for example, we'll, I'll use the example of height, okay? Um, for a person, to explain why the normal curve, how does it even happen once? Um, so for a person to be very tall, many factors have to come into play, genetic and environmental. So let's think of each of those factors as a dice roll where you get something between one and six, and then at the end, you sum up all of those dice roll outcomes, and you get something that signifies your height. Uh, that's like an oversimplified version of what kind of is actually happening. Like, to be really tall, you need to like proverbially roll like a bunch of sixes on like genetic factors and environmental factors. And to be really short, you need to roll a bunch of ones. Basically, you know, get a lot of rare things lining up. Um, there are a lot more ways to sum up to, to things, to sum up to die to be an average that's somewhere in the middle than there are to sum up to die to be something on the ends. Uh, so, oh, here also I marked up my height, <laughs> my natural height, my true height, which is my average height in my platform seat. <laughs> and blue is again my goal height. Um, okay, so I'm gonna explain this height thing more. Now imagine like, instead of there being many factors that are dice rolls that sum up to be my height, what if only one dice roll determined my height? Um, then that's pretty easy to think about. Okay, like I have an equal, if it's a fair die, uh, don't forget that's a singular. If it's a fair die, it's a uniformly distributed probability for each of them. So that's called the uniform distribution and it looks like that. But now imagine if there's two dice that need to be rolled to give me my height. Um, now you can get anything between two and 12 instead of just between one and six. And there are more ways to add up to the values in the middle, like to roll a seven, you can get a six and a one or a one and a six, a two and a five or a five and a two, a four and a three or a three and a four. But to get a 12, there's only one way to do that, getting a six and a six. And to get a two, there's only one way to do that. So the probabilities get distributed more unevenly as you add the second die. And now, oops, yeah. Um, and now let's imagine that there's three dice rolls that determine my height. That's that one. Um, now, like, they, they summed up the probabilities again and by looking at the number of ways to add up to things. And 
now there's less of a disparity in the middle. You can see like between the very middle and the things just to the right and left in it, there's less of a difference. It's kind of flattening out. And the flattening and the smoothing happens even more when you have four dice. That's that one there. So what I'm trying to say is that it occurs so much in nature because that's kind of how like nature works is like all of these things are little dice rolls like that could happen and like then get summed up to make whatever the outcome is like how much cow like how much milk a cow produces is like a sum of many dice rolls as well so as are people's heights does that make sense mm -hmm. cool um why didn't they explain it that way to me um so it's important to know one thing so that these dice rolls that make up things that follow a normal distribution uh they the like the things that they represent like a person's height are independent trials meaning like let's say i'm born and i'm amazing and tall and then another <laughs> randomly chosen baby is born the fact that i'm tall has no effect on their probability of being tall they can't like a new baby being born can't just be like oh that person's tall that looks cool i'm gonna be tall they, it's a totally new trial that has nothing to do with the previous trials. Um, and that will come up later, and I'll explain why. So yeah, most things are normal. Oh, but not bell. Okay, yeah, this is confusing to some people. Okay. The bell curve is normal, but bell from Beauty and the Beast is not normal. Okay, the townspeople are always saying that, and I know that that could be tricky. You guys, thanks for laughing. No one laughed last, last time, but I, I kept it anyway. This was felt so strong. Um, all right, so there's many other probability distributions that occur for various reasons, various differences in the types of variables, etc. So I'm just going to talk for the rest of the, the time about one other one, which is the power law, the power distribution. So this is the power law distribution, aka the Pareto distribution, aka the 80-20 rule. So again, the axis here is still the same. This still represents like the value of an outcome and this still represents the frequency of that value. So this is a distribution that happens a lot in nature as well, like like the normal distribution, but like imagine if like people's heights followed the normal distribution. It would be like 90% of people would be like one feet and then there'd be a few people that are like 20 feet tall and like a few people in between. Like that's what that's what's so weird is that this is like not an not normal, um, and it occurs a lot, and I'll, I'll tell you how, where it occurs, okay? Here are some examples. In human natural language, did you know that if you learn the right 5% of Spanish words, you will understand 90% of conversation? And if you wanna like understand 100%, you have to learn like 80% more of the words. Like It's like diminishing returns after that initial 5%. Uh, in Peter Thiel's business strategy, he talks about this in zero to one. I honestly haven't read it. I know it's really important to like being rich and stuff, so like could someone read it and explain to me. Um, okay, these are some really serious real life ones. In crime, okay, like crime, like the crimes per person, like committed by a person, follows a power law distribution. There's a few people that do most crimes, and then most other people just do a few crimes in their life. Um, the topology of the World Wide Web, like. The, if you count the number of links coming into websites, they follow a power law distribution. A few websites have all the incoming links and the rest are like tail off like that. Financial wealth, obviously, sadly, is one that follows the power law and that's like a big big deal too because like back you know in the day, people would try and argue that like trickle down economics will work and that the people who are getting rich will like eventually do something for the other people, but that would only be the case if there was like a normal distribution, but it doesn't really. Um, so yeah, like ten percent of people have like ninety percent of wealth. Oh no! You disconnected. I did. I thought you were upset about the wealth thing. I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. Um, Are you casting? Yeah, let me try again. Yeah. Oh, we're starting over. Oh, the top. Okay, guys. <laughs> Ready? Thank you for coming to the dress room. Red string. Um. Okay, yeah. Um, sexual assaulters, all right. You know, like in Me Too, a lot of women were like, it has to be like, you know, every man's doing it because every woman in her life like feels like at some point they have something bad happen to them. But 
not all men is the hashtag that rebuts that. And it's kind of actually true because while most women will be a victim of something in their life, only few of the men are responsible for most of those problems. Uh, it's like crazy. So if we like went after a few people like R. Kelly, Harvey Weinstein, it would make a huge difference actually because they're like there's a few people who are the bad guys from the worst. Same with police brutality. And this one's really interesting to me. Speciation, meaning how species get distributed among genuses follows a power law. Like 90% of species are in 10% of genuses. Once a species, once a genus already has more species, it's more likely to, be, to spring up with new ones. And when it has few, it's less likely, and it just kind of spirals out from there. Um, social media followers, it's easier to get followers when you have followers. Same with like social media views. Like I always think of like memes, like you know, like certain memes like have all the views of Instagram, and it's just weird. Um, all right, so how? Oh wait, where's my little? Uh -uh. I can't, I don't have my notes. Oh, I, I can do it there. Okay, sorry. Um, so, so it really does occur a lot, and it's been there forever. Like it's even in how how species work. So it's not just like a human thing, you know. Um, and so people started to really like learn about this when there were some bitter sociologists back in the '60s. Okay, they noticed that whenever they, whenever like one of them came up with an idea that was really good and groundbreaking in like sociology or just like a solid idea, they found that they never would get the credit for it. It would always end up being someone more famous who came up with it like at the same time or a little later. And they were like, why is it that this always like happens? It feels like the rich get richer. Um, and they actually like mapped out all of the citations between papers in like the academic like PhD world. And they found that like, that follows the power law distribution too. Like 10% of the papers or the authors get like 90% of incoming citations and that makes them get more popular. So they like were just kind of, you know, documenting that they were not famous for a reason. Um, and they proved it with science. And um, they called it the role of the Matthew effect in science because in the Bible they say, uh, in Matthew, they say the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So people have been not noticing this for a while. Um, I've noticed this myself in stand-up comedy, which I do. Um, so there are like some, like you see this also in comedy where like people can come up with the same joke at the same time pretty much because we all live in the same world. We're all like kind of thinking about the same things. It's kind of likely that like jokes will be similar, but when a more famous person has a joke than a less famous person, the less famous person always has to give it up because they will look like the hack, you know, because no one knows who they are. And then they'll be like, that's, you know, someone's so joke. But then there's also real people that really ride that. Like there's this famous case, like, do you guys know who Bill Hicks is? So crazy. Okay, so Bill Hicks was this stand-up comic who came about the same time as Dennis Leary. And him and Dennis Leary were actually friends. And Bill Hicks, like, you know, was like really well liked. He just kind of started a little bit later than Dennis Leary. And then Dennis Leary just like lifted his whole act and whole persona from Bill Hicks. Like it was so well known to all comedians, but it wasn't well known to the world. So like comedians all had Bill Hicks's back, even while the world was just like lifting Dennis Leary up to the top and Bill Hicks was dying of cancer. That's the other crazy thing. And Bill Hicks famously said like to a journalist, a journalist like came up to him outside a comedy club and was like, what do you say to all these allegations to like what do you say about the the rumors that Dennis Leary stole your act and Bill Hicks said I have a scoop for you I stole his act I camouflaged it with punchlines and to real really throw people off I did it before him um he's just saying that of course he stole his act uh it's so sad it's not, that guy's not famous only people know about it is comedians who just think it's sad um that that happened so then there's some real joke thieves out there but then there's also some like people that, you know, this gal, love her, uh, she like came up with some jokes at the same time as me and then like now I don't do them anymore. And I don't think she stole my jokes. We just like both were thinking about the same things. <laughs> um, so she's a beneficiary of the power law and parallel thought. Uh, they probably are joke thieves, so it's kind of like, I don't know. I, I'm on the fence having you should work because some of the times like, that's sort of my point too is like, Sometimes I think people seem like they're joke thieves when they're not because of this power law thing where like people get famous and some people get famous and some people don't. You could always find two people who've had the same joke. Anyway, um, all right, so enough with the comedy thing. I just thought it was really interesting. So back to this power law thing. 
one really important thing to note about it is like in this distribution, like if you add more inputs into the system, it, do, it just gets like bigger. It's called the scale free thing because basically like, let's say if like, you know, um, well, I'll get into that later. Basically it's, a, it's scale free because if you were to add more to this, like the tails would just get bigger. These, this would get bigger and this, this would get longer. And when you zoom out, it would look the same. So it's scale free like a fractal. Whereas with the normal distribution, all that would happen is it would just fill in the curve fill in under the curve what's already there. It wouldn't actually like change the distribution. The distribution wouldn't like get bigger over time. Um, so that's why this is called a scale free. Um, so, okay, I'm sorry about all the math. It's about to get really interesting, I swear. The power law phenomenon relates to how people interact. Uh, so in order to understand that, I have to tell you guys a little bit about social networks and graph theory. So, all right, you guys, I'll do this really quick. So graph theory, is just how we represent networks in like math. Do you guys know about this at all? Yeah, oh cool, okay, some of you. So it's like, so nodes represent things that are like nouns and edges represent like relationships uh, between them and the degree of a node means the number of edges going out of it. So this has degree two because there's two things. This has degree three, this one. So that's just a little background. Now, there are a few types of graphs that we've seen that they've like talked about in math because they think that they could represent things in nature. One is called this lattice graph, where it's like things are, the degree distribution is really uniform. Every node has the same number of edges and the, what edges the nodes, what edges are between what nodes has only to do with like how close they are to each other. At one point we thought maybe like this would be a representation of how our social network worked because like, oh people, you know, like just know each other based on where they live and like everyone has friends, like, so that's one way they've like looked into mapping how society works. Um, and then another way is a random graph, where basically imagine you just like throw a bunch of nodes on a piece of paper, and then you decide like I'm going to add 20 edges, and then at random you choose two nodes, and like two, choose one node, choose two another node. Okay, now draw draw a line between them. Do that like totally random process 20 times, and then you have the like basically there's all of these nodes have equal odds of being part of like some edge system and they follow like a, a normal curve distribution like the number of edges per node. Then there's this other kind of graph but this is different and this they call actually a scale free graph and I'll explain why but um, I mentioned scale free before it has to do with the power law. Um, so basically in this graph um, there's a few you can see most of these things have like a small number of edges like two or three and then there's a few that have like 20 or 30. And um, that's what's important about, that's what makes those graphs different. So yeah, now I will get, oh, okay, I missed some effects that were really cool and worth it. All right, so social networks are graphs. Um, we like can represent how we, how the structure of who knows who in using these things that I just explained graphs. And when we do that, we think of social distance as the number of jumps I would have to make to get to a person like so like me and Heather are like one jump away because we know each other but like her like grandma is two away from me because even though your grandma could be in China or in New York like the, the social distance is just two it's like how many people do you have to go through okay so that's all important background when I talk about social networks I don't mean on Facebook Jimmy won't be friends with me on Facebook but we're still in a social network too. All right, so you guys, this is, there's this crazy experiment in the 60s called the Milgram experiment. It's not the one where like, you know the Milgram experiment where, like, where they get everyone to like torture each other? This is a different one, but it's just as cool. It has to do with like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon thing. Do you guys know about that? Okay, cool. So this guy Milgram, he had a friend who was in, Milgram was from like Ohio or something, and he had a friend who was in Tunisia on vacation and they were he was at a cafe and he met a British guy and the British guy they got to talking and the British guy said how he used to live in Detroit and then the friend from Ohio said oh that's crazy like uh I had also lived in Detroit at some point and then the British guy was like do you don't happen to know this person and the other guy was like what that's my boss and he was like that's my best friend and they were like that's so weird we're 
like Tunisian and Brit and British, like why do we know like know one person in common? And Milgram had thought about this a lot because he felt like this happens way too much for how often like it feels like it should. Like it feels like the odds of two randomly selected people knowing someone in common feels like that should be low because the world is so big and they're totally randomly selected. But it feels like that could happen like any time. It feels like it happens like more than half the time you actually talk to someone. Like you could figure out that you know someone. So he wanted to get to the bottom of, is that true that we're actually really closely connected to most people in the world? And if so, why? So he came up with this experiment. He chose 300 random people from the phone book and he gave them each a folder. And then he chose 300 other random people from the folder and assigned uh, like the pe basically, oh, sorry, with no folder. Basically he assigned the people with the folders the goal of getting that folder to this other random person that was just chosen from the phone book. And like he said, you can't like, this was in the 60s, you couldn't Google them anyway, but he said like, all you can do is, I'll just tell you their name and their city, all you can do is mail it to someone that you think can get it closer to them. And like, I wanted to see how like, if this works, if we can ever get the folders to people. Um, and it was crazy, the results were actually, do you guys get the experiment? Okay, so the results were actually crazy because like the, the first folder started arriving in four days with only going through one person. So like, that's crazy. Like these are totally random people. Um, they ended up doing two successful experiments and in the first one, 44 out of 160 folders got there. Second one, 64 out of 300 got there. And the average distance was six. Like the average number of people that a folder had to go through was six. Seems so low, right? Um, so they fi figured out a few things about it. The chains are not random, the things, the things people go through. Um, people think, like, basically, we all occupy different social networks that are all overlapping on each other. Like, I'm part of the social network of people that enjoy computer science, and I'm also part of the social network of people that enjoy reality shows. And like, I can connect those two social networks. And so we all are part of those different things, and that makes it like, that makes distances much quicker than they need than they might otherwise need to. Another thing was that was really crazy was that a few people, like who weren't the they weren't the original people who had the folder, but certain people just had multiple folders come through them. There was this one guy in particular who got sixteen folders sent to him in the course of this experiment, and he was just a random like grocer in Milwaukee. I think, and he's just one of those like people, you know how like, it's like in Malcolm Gladwell, they're the connectors, he's like a social hub. And the other crazy thing was that the dropout rate was really high, so they think that all of these results would have been even better if like people were being paid more or like forced to send it through, because a lot of people just decided like, I don't wanna mail this. Um, so this brings me back to these graphs. What he was discovering and proving was that we live in this kind of graph in the middle where those people like the grocer are the people like this note that has like thousands of things coming out of it. And then most of us are like people just out here like normals. And um, those very well connected nodes become very important in this small world. So he was proving that, you know, we live in the small world and that the people that have a lot of influence in the small world are kind of important. Oh, I did it again, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so they've done Siegel Sitz's experiment. They did it with mathematicians. They figured out that like, you know, every single mathematician who's ever been cool in the math world is only six degrees away from a certain mathematician named Erdos, who's just like pretty like prolific. He's the Kevin Bacon of math. They've also done it with Kevin Bacon. Did you guys know that 88% of actors right now are connected to Kevin Bacon by less than six degrees? And of that 88%, 98.3% are less than four uh, people away from Kevin Bacon. He's, it's like, doesn't even feel like Kevin Bacon does anything, but that's just how it works. Um, and the maximum number of the other crazy thing is that in our social networks, like you're either like six degrees away from someone max or infinity. Like if you can't get between me and this random person in the world in less than six degrees, it's because you can't get, we can't connect at all. Like. There's some people that are just like in different like parts of the network and they will never like, you know, like think of like, you know, like like Williamsburg, like the Orthodox Jewish people, like they're in their own like social network that like it would be really hard for me to like get a folder to them. But like for them to get a folder to other people that I'm not connected to at all would be easy. Basically, it's like the distance is either 
one, two, three, four, five, six, or infinity between people. And the people that are like the grosser, they have a much lower odds of being infinity distance from anyone because they are so well connected. Um, so now I want to talk about why does this kind of network have to, what does this kind of network have to do with the power law? Well, it has a lot to do with it because it's what gives rise to a power law distribution. So previously before the Milgram experiment, the underlying like assumption, assumption in like math and sociology was that like people were following like a normal distribution in how they interacted. And that would mean that, you know, the, like the graph of America would look like this, like people are just connected in a sort of like even way and uh, like, in this, okay, and then I'll get to the really good slide. Okay, so now I filled in the nodes and stuff. So this would be like all of these people with like a sort of average number of nodes, of edges coming out of the node are like in the normal. And then there's a few outliers on either side. This would be like what we used to think it was, but then Milgram proved that we like live like this, really, where there's a few people that are on these crazy, like that are these crazy hubs, like a small number of them, so they're low on the Y, but really high number of links coming out of them. So really far on the X. And then most of us are just like here. And so the point with that is that, like basically he proved that when you see a power law distribution in nature or in like something in society, there's an underlying graph that has this kind of property where there's some people that are major, some nodes that are major hubs and many nodes that are just kind of normal kind of, they, we, when we say average, doesn't even mean anything in the power law sense, but anyway. Um, so yeah, so the, it means that we've got a underlying graph with this kind of clustering uh, factor. And because these, like basically, it means that we have to always like look for the underlying graph. If there's something like happening in nature, like, you know, like what's the underlying social graph that's affecting like how wealth gets distributed because it's the same thing. Um, Okay, so furthermore, he proved that that this social network graph structure is what gives rise to the small world effect uh, because it gives certain people the ability to be really closely linked. Like those grocers are the things that make us all easily connected to each other. Um, okay, guys. So it's really cool that we live in this small world and nowadays, you know, with it not being the 60s and all, we can feel the effects much more with social media and with like the rise of celebrities. Like, you know, you have cool things happen where Kevin Hart can easily get in touch with this artist from Nigeria or whatever because he just has to, he's just Kevin Hart. He can just say like, tweet out once, everybody like give me this guy's info and he'll probably get it really fast. Um, you might say, oh, that's not that crazy. because like, he's Kevin Hart. Like, of course he could do whatever he wants, but, or like in terms of getting in touch with people that shouldn't seem that hard. But then there's also those cases like, this, we're like, you know, the, do you, did you guys see this one? This couple was proposing on a cliff somewhere and this guy who was really far away took this nice picture of them and he was like, I saw this couple proposing on this day here and like tweeted out. Oh my God, and it got to them amazing. in like one, like one person away. Cause like, you know, you only need one person who's really famous, like Kevin Hart to like that and tweet it. And then it's guaranteed to get back to that couple. So like, I you don't, I know, I, it gives so me the chill. It, happy. it gives me the chill, it's crazy. <laughs> they like, have that amazing picture now. They have that amazing picture now, and it's because of like, back in the day, the only people that, we had celebrities, but celebrities were people that everyone knew. They're not necessarily people that know everyone. Now we have like celebrities that are people that know everyone. Like, they not only are known to everyone, like they follow them back, they can interact with them, and they like, have a very flatter like relationship. So people that basically social influence is could be could be a pretty crazy thing today. Um, we'll get more into that now. So the small world effect that Milgram was flipping out about back then is just much more on crack now. So my whole point here is that a scale-free network is that's what we call that kind of social net that kind of network that I showed you that has the nodes with a few hubs and they give, it gives rise to a power law. It's called scale-free because the power law is scale-free, uh, the power law distribution. And a scale-free network is lurking beneath all of these observable power law distributions. So that's a really important takeaway. Okay, you guys, now, is the time up? Out of a few more minutes? Um, five more minutes. Oh shit, okay. 
Well, I'll just tell you quickly, what gives rise to a scale-free social network? There's a few things, okay? Okay, imagine it's my first day at Vettery and I'm trying to decide who I wanna be friends with and I see some people hanging out in the group and one person who's alone. Who am I gonna go hang out with? The group of people, probably not the person who's alone. Now that group has one more person. So the next new person to start at Vettery is even less likely to, they're gonna be even more drawn towards that group than to the singleton. Um, so that kind of is the, that attachment algorithm is what gives rise to any time that you see this scale-free network. Um, the two things that matter are growth over time, meaning these networks are made, not born. You don't just like put people in a room and then have society. It's like people are introduced one at a time and how long you've been on this earth actually like matters to your social, like whatever influence or your whatever influence it can be. And then the other thing that matters to it is uh, that there is this thing called preferential attachment, uh, which means that as nodes join the network, they're more likely to form edges to nodes that have more edges. That's the rich get rich, richer thing. So like the more popular you are, the easier it is to become more popular. Uh, if you have more money, it's easier to become rich. You got like more edges of money coming in and out of you, basically. That's like how you would visualize that graph. So I talked earlier about all these power law things. Oh yeah, and another crazy thing about this, when you think of, uh, when you think of it in terms of the preferential attachment in the, like that algorithm that I just talked about, the reason it's really scale free is because like, okay, like, like think of this and that, think of this as if it was representing like people on Instagram or something, and this is the, these are the average normal people, and this is like Kylie Jenner with the most followers ever. As more people join Instagram, she's gonna get more followers more easily than anyone else. So instead of just this graph getting more filled out, it's just gonna push Kylie Jenner over to here. She'll just get better. Like, and, and then so there will just be more people here, but like it's just gonna scale, like it's just gonna get bigger. Like imagine it's like in terms of height, like the more people that were born, like made people get taller. Like, no, like that's how this works, but that's crazy. So it's like the more famous people there are in the system, or there, the more people that there are in the system, the more famous some people will get. So how does this part get taller? I understand like it right. gets more spread out like Kylie Jenner, but then. So this part gets taller because it only represents just the number of people. Uh, okay. Like, or like the number of nodes. So it's like, these are like average people. Like this is a new Instagram follower. They're gonna have very few followers. Also, like a new, as more new people get added, this they they, they, they add themselves and here, and they push oh, okay. the people. They push the people who are mm -hmm. up further up. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and same with money. It's like, you know, if you pump more like people into an economic system, mm -hmm. it's not trickle down at all. It's like trickle. It's like pushing up. We're mm -hmm. pushing up the rich people to be more rich by mm -hmm. adding more people to the system. So it's crazy. Um, all right. So a scale-free network is a network. Uh, is that network I just showed you, and it gives rise to a power law, and a scale-free network is lurking beneath all these observable power law distributions. And wealth metrics follow a power law, not just financial, financial wealth. In sociology, wealth could be like anything that's a measured, a thing that you can try to measure that has to do with an advantage in life. So like, you're like, well, we'll see. Um, and so yeah, I said some possible other ones, but. Um, like privilege, like, you know, the more privileged you are, the easier it is to gain more privilege from society, the more benefit of the doubt society will give you <clears throat> if you're someone who looks like, it's, you know, it's like, it's, it's horrible to think about, but it's basically, yeah, so the whole point of why this, this whole, all this topic, like, really blows my mind. Um, so I don't want to, like, say too much because I wanted to, like, have a discussion. Influence is a form of wealth too. Any, a lot of things would be wealth metrics that aren't just money or these things like social media influencers, like that's a form of wealth, like the people that they can influence, but there's a lot of other things out there that we can't like quantify right now that probably also follow a power law. Um, and so yeah, discussion. That was it, guys, I'm sorry, I was like. <laughs> that was awesome. Thanks, guys. Does it really? I'm sorry. I should have like said you should ask more questions. Throughout. Can I answer any questions right now? Or uh, do you I guys have a question. Me? Yeah. Do you think that like this is becoming more extreme? Obviously, like Instagram is like a very easy, like tangible example. But like, 
I'm th thinking about like politics, for example, yeah. or like media, right? Like certain tools. Do you think that the tools that exist, like mainstream media, like 24 hour, I do think so. Like exacerbates and like I can yeah. yeah. Does it? But it still doesn't change like the allocation. It just push. It just stretches it. It kind of just makes everyone more. So like think about it this way: is like you know if we had. If news was given to us like randomly, like maybe like that's really that's a great question. It's like because then what would be the solution to that? Is like if I want to get news and instead of me choosing to look for opinions that I already agree with, like because that's the other thing. It's like there's actual underlying algorithms happening. Like you know, like Google will push things up that has more likes. Like Instagram will push things up that are similar to things that I have liked or that are liked by people who are similar to me. So like we become more like further apart, like Republicans become more Republican, Democrats become more Democrat. And, and it's what if instead we were randomly paired with like pen pals, like that might actually be like the solution. It's like, <laughs> like giving people random connections that they wouldn't otherwise have. I actually put that in my discussion question. It's like when I learned about this stuff, it changed how I felt about, I have like a racist uncle who I like cut off from my life. And then I learned about this stuff and I realized that like, ideas spread like viruses and like the more people that he knows that are not exactly like him the less likely he is to like spread his virus so like i have to stay in his social network for the good of society so it's like yeah that's a long answer but i agree i think that i think that the way things the way that we spread things that like, is irresponsible and like should be thought about like suicide is contained like they do a lot of stuff in the news that like they know now from medical perspectives is not good like you know like even just like the documenting of the school shooters and stuff, like they don't—they only exist because like, because of the ones that have existed, you know. So I don't know. Sorry, I'm ranting again. But um, yeah. So I think that definitely when it just comes to politics and like fake or like whatever news you want to listen to, there's literally underlying stuff. Un there's literally underlying algorithms and search engines and stuff that make the problem worse. But then there's also just the fact that we're people and we like what we like already. And so, yeah. I got one. So this can also be really like discouraging for the people who are like just joining a certain group yeah. or like how, how do you address the thought that like, oh, they're super popular. I'm using like, yeah, like popular is an easy like, example. Yeah. But, like how do you, how do you basically talk to that group and like help them to break in versus like stay on the outskirts because they're so discouraged that they'll never like. Totally. I think it has to do with like, sort of like top down interventions that reward people based on their initial like rate for, versus their current, like where they are. Like I see this a lot with like, for instance, like women in tech. Like if you're a woman in tech, you're already probably like smarter on average. <laughs> like just because like the fact for you to get there was took more hurdles. So like, if you, like, I might not be, I shouldn't use myself as an example, but like some woman who is in the room where it's, there's more adversity for her to be there. Like, don't take into account just where they are right then, but like the growth that they've shown because like, even for them to be there, they kind of were that node that's really far on the, I don't know, that's not a good, maybe I'm not explaining it well, but like, I think that there has to be top-down interventions that that give those, that kind of shake things up a bit, like to give, to create more fair, fairness. Like if you have, they even have thought about this, like, you know, with magnet schools, there are some like really good magnet schools that they just use a total like lottery system because even if the kids are chosen randomly rather than like based on merit, like it adds, like it makes a difference in like their networks and their, like, you know, I, I don't know. I think that there's something about like, imagine, so things will always tend to a power law distribution. So I think the best we can do is who's is switch, is, is find ways to switch who's at the top. The magnet school is really very topical because in New York, that's like a massive problem. And what is They just, magnet schools, like they just announced the, the new incoming class for like the um, New York City's top schools, which are based on an exam. And it's like zero point five percent black, right? And like sixty five so percent right. Asian, so and it's just like the way the problem is that in order to like lift people up, it has to be at the expense of the people that are currently at the top in some way. Exactly. There's but not that's room, why there's only so much room yeah. all the way at the end, right? Mm -hmm. So there has to be like 
the but problem is that in order for people to like lean into that, there has to be some benefit that they get, which is where, which is why there's like nobody's come up with a solution for this like public school issue. I know that's why. I, see, like that's why I do, I don't I do see that as an example though of like how it's easier to like even if you're even if you like expand the the node that you're part of to be like a whole group that you're be a part of like it's easier to get like to improve once you've already gotten that ball rolling so it's like they have to do some, i don't know what they're going to do but my like weird dystopian or utopian idea would be like just like sort of like radical like more affirmative action because I don't now that I know all this stuff about the power law I don't see affirmative action as like what I used to see it as which is like a fair way to like correct like wrongs of society but now I see it as like an actual like appropriate measure of merit because there should be a different scale for people who've had more <clears throat> adversity like because they've had less nodes they've had less like edges in the system so to speak so it's like more with less. you're not yeah so it's like if you're in that if you're in exactly so yeah it's like not even about like oh this is the right thing to do to like equal things out it's like oh no like there's a there's there, there, those people are better if they like could do that with this power law structure being so hardcore against them you know what's interesting about the school thing is that like the one of the solutions that's been floated but again like nobody even like very progressive New Yorkers have like not committed to anything because it's so oh, cool. controversial but um, one of the like ways around it is right if you like skew away from the tech just the te merit but then in order to like accommodate all of the Asian Americans that would then get like booted from the top schools just like artificially expanding by like adding one more school so that actually the total count stays the same even though the proportions skew which is like kind of an artificial manipulation of the curve so just like put the people that are like Basically, add increase more people capacity. To, yeah, increase the capacity to like account for shifting that part of the power law right. distribution up, and then everyone else can shift up, but they, they're still there. Right. I guess that that makes. I mean, I don't see why that's bad. That's like know. the only even remotely viable solution yeah. that's come out. The problem too is that they've like, you know, they've sort of also like proven that without top-down interventions, those pro these problems only get worse. So they actually like really just proved that in like some students paper did while I was in grad school and it was like everyone was like crying like my professors and stuff because it was like oh my god this is a huge breakthrough that we have to like officially acknowledge that like any time there's a disparity it's just gonna get worse and we can't like just hope for the best we have to like do these things to shake it down but then there's also you know there's also good things like good ideas also can spread like or you know you could you could use the power law structure to spread good things too. So I don't know. Like we could just if we get Kylie Jenner to like learn to code, like that could do a lot. But that's like not good because Carly Claus did that and I hated that. <laughs> <laughs> code with claws. Is that mm -hmm. what it's called? Code with claws. Yeah, she's an idiot. <laughs> this is so interesting. Okay, sorry, sorry I continue. Thank you for joining. Thanks for joining. Thanks, guys.